after <laughs> all of the Two. scheduling. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Center for the Living Cities Jane Jacobs Lecture Series. This is our fifth lecture of spring 22, and it's a good one. Uh, we've been very excited for this talk. Uh, please follow us on our newsletter, and you, we will pick up again in the fall with another series of our lectures. This particular lecture is being brought to you as a partnership with the AIA of Northeastern Pennsylvania and Marywood University School of Architecture, along with the Center for the Living City. So we have Allison Sanch from Studio for Urban Projects, an author of a new book, From the Ground Up, and she has a wonderful esteemed panel with her that she will introduce in just a minute. My name is Maria McDonald, and I am the executive director of the Center for the Living City. I'm coming to you from Scranton, Pennsylvania, the home of Jane Jacobs, hometown. And also, um, Jane Jacobs is also one of the founders of the Center for the Living City. Behind the scenes disappeared, we have Chelsea Gauthier, the associate director of the Center for the Living City. She's joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah. So I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do, and then we'll let you take it over, Allison. Um, so I'm going to introduce Allison, and then during the talk, please feel free to drop questions into the Q&A section of the um, Zoom panel. It, uh, the panel will talk for about 45 minutes, and then I'll reappear, and we will take questions for the last 15 minutes. Closed captioning is available on this, and then later on this evening, this talk will be posted onto the Center for the Living Cities YouTube channel and on our website. Um, also, we'll have a special offer being dropped into the chat for Allison's book for those of you who attended this lecture. And any AIA members who haven't already put in your ID number, please email Chelsea or send us somehow your number so you can get your CEU credits. Okay, that's the housekeeping. So now I get to introduce Allison. Hi, Allison. Hello. Thank <laughs> you for having me. And all thank of you. Thank you and all of you. <laughs> Allison Sant is a partner and co-founder of Studio for Urban Projects, an interdisciplinary design collaborative based in San Francisco that works at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, art, and social activism. For more than 15 years, the studio has focused on public programming, urban prototyping, and civic dialogue, aiming to bring social justice and sustainability to the design of cities. Sant is the author of From the Ground Up, Local Efforts to Create Resilient Cities with Island Press 2022, a book that examines how American cities are mitigating and adapting to climate change while creating greater equity and livability. She has taught at the California College of the Arts, the San Francisco Art Institute, and the College of Environmental Design, University of California, Berkeley. Allison, thank you, thank you. Everyone, thank you for being here, for putting this wonderful talk together. I'm disappearing. I'll see you all in a little bit. Thank you and hello to all of you. And thank you to the Center for the Living City an amazing organization for inviting this conversation and to Maria and Chelsea for hosting today's event. And I'd also like to thank our panelists, Tamika Butler, John Bella and Danny Simmons who I will introduce shortly. So I'll start with an overview of the themes of the book and the case studies it describes to give some context to our conversation. I admit to being especially honored um, to be a part of the Jane Jacobs lecture series as she is a mentor. And the legacy of her community-based approach to city building is core to the efforts I describe in my book, From the Ground Up. Jane was a remarkable woman who ignited a movement in New York and around the world insistent on making cities for people. Her leadership helped to stop a four-lane road from, getting, from gutting Washington Square Park and plans to make expressways across Manhattan. Robert Moses' efforts were fiercely and successfully opposed by neighborhood groups activated by Jane Jacobs, who saw urban renewal and its proposal to bulldoze slums and rebuild the city with skyscrapers and multi-lane highways as the antithesis of healthy urban life. As she wrote in The Dark Age Ahead, the automobile has been the chief destroyer of American communities. And she was right. The Federal Highway Act gutted neighborhoods in cities across the country, such as the Rondo neighborhood, once the center of St. Paul's Black community, which was demolished in 1956 to construct the I-94 freeway. These planning choices have left multi-generational scars that physically divide communities, promote segregation and disinvestment, and perpetuate poverty. Systemic racism has shaped the American urban landscape, 
making communities of color disproportionately affected by air pollution, causing higher rates of asthma, higher incidence of COVID, cancer, and premature death. As From the Ground Up describes, this legacy has created long-term disparities, including access to efficient pu public transportation, well-maintained parks, street trees, economic and educational opportunities, and even the community engagement processes that shape neighborhoods and cities. And as climate change continues to raise temperatures, cause flooding and force people to move, how people are impacted is also shaped by the history of systemic racism in this country. Due to discriminatory policies like redlining and restrictive covenants, race is too often correlated with where people live in cities, what elevation they live at, what temperatures they're exposed to, and what resources they have access to in times of emergency. As a result, climate change disproportionately affects under-resourced communities and communities of color. Even today, there are plans to expand the I-94 highway in North Minneapolis, making infrastructure like the Northside Greenway, a project advanced by locals to create a three mile greenway for biking and walking, critical to a different vision for what is possible. The community-led organization Northside Greenway Now organizes neighborhood rides and engagement block parties. They have asked residents to determine how investments should be made in North Minneapolis, creating a common vision for the future. In one of the best biking cities in the US, where 4% of residents ride their bikes to school and work, investments need to be made across its neighborhoods fairly. With proper resources and political will, communities like those in North Minneapolis are poised to lead the change ahead. As Northside Greenway Now co-founder Will Lumpkin said, I'm hoping that we can be a prototype going forward for what greenways could look like, particularly because we're always coming up behind and getting the scraps. I wanna be a leader in transportation and what that looks like. As the city plans to roll out another 51 miles of neighborhood greenways as a part of its transportation action plan, the, comp the completion of the Northside Greenway is hinging on the city making it a priority for federal infrastructure funding. But through its engagement process, Northside Greenway now has shown that these investments, what these investments can create for the residents of North Minneapolis. Often change comes because of experiments that start small and then scale their successes. In San Francisco, these approaches were ignited in 2005 when a collective of artists and designers called Rebar, of which John was a member, created a global street intervention later known as Parking Day. On a sunny weekday morning in November, Rebar members fed a downtown San Francisco parking meter and set up a temporary park with grass, a bench, and a young bay tree. There, the park remained for two hours until the meter ran out. They rolled up the sod, packed away the bench and the tree, gave the spot a sweep, and left. The idea took off. People were eager to see cities change, and Parking Day allowed them to make this, take this process into their own hands. The idea inspired the city's official parklet program and exploded with the shared spaces program today. In 2019, the city had just 76 parklets, but by February 2022, San Francisco tallied over 2,000 shared space applications. Roads account for more than 25% of urban areas. What should they best be used for and how should they be programmed? This massive experiment has been testing these ideas. In New York, Jane Jacobs' legacy is also a part of continued efforts to reclaim the streets. By scaling successful pilot projects, New York has a track record of manifesting bold visions for how to make its city streets for people. Their summer streets launched in 2008 with Danny's leadership, helped to create the vision for the 550 miles of protected bike lanes installed in New York City as of 2020 and the commitment by Mayor Adams to invest more than $900 million to address the city's rising traffic violence and create safer streets and public transportation infrastructure. New York City has closed roads to traffic, creating the first parking protected bike lane in the United States, launched the most extensive US bike share program and experimented with rap rapid bus routes and dedicated busways. And in 2023, New York plans to have a new revenue source for improving its public transit infrastructure through congestion pricing which has been approved by the state, and it would be the first city in the country to impose it. But these public space amenities, transportation options, and infrastructure is not always available to everyone. Even during the pandemic, as streets were opened in cities across the country for walking, biking, rolling, and playing, recent studies suggest that they have exacerbated growing spatial inequalities, focusing on specific neighborhoods while neglecting others. 
They have been criticized for being created without adequate public input and ignoring that for many, physical infrastructure is only one piece of creating safe streets for biking and walking. Throughout the United States, communities of color are commonly harassed by the police, making walking the streets or riding a bike and taking transit more dangerous, if not deadly. As Tamika wrote in her essay in From the Ground Up, it, was, it is no surprise that many people of color questioned if closing streets could benefit the mental and physical health of residents if walking or running in their neighborhoods with or without slow and open streets could lead to their death at the hands of white supremacist police officers or private citizens. And as transportation planner and community organizer, Dr. Destiny Thomas made clear, safe streets are not safe for black lives. The most effective solutions are born out of the communities they serve. We need to address systemic problems by investing in communities to lead the solutions ahead and be supported by government policies and funding in doing so. As Jane Jacobs wrote in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. The launch of bike share in central Brooklyn's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood is an example Although New York City has some of the best public transit in the country, Bed-Stuy has been historically underserved. Although City Bike insta installed bike share stations, the majority of residents did not ride them. Many locals viewed the program as an amenity for people outside their community, or worse, as a tool for, of gentrification and displacement. Tracy Capers of Bed-Stuy Restoration, a community development corporation, led a group called the New York City Better Bike Share Partnership to improve bike share service as a part of its efforts to create access to healthier and more efficient forms of transit for residents, the majority of whom are black people with household incomes below the citywide mean. Together, the partnership shaped a bike share system in the neighborhood to reflect the needs of their community, be affordable, and lay the seeds for creating job opportunities and greater local leadership. They organized a series of community events featuring helmet giveaways, bike safety lessons, and neighborhood rides. Youths were hired as ambassadors to survey residents and understand what they needed. Some even went on to join the New York City DOT. Restoration met with local precincts to address racial profiling and make it safer for people of color to ride. Doctors and local hospitals prescribed free bike share memberships to encourage active transportation. Local employers purchased subsidized memberships and recipients of the Federal Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP were given discounts. In total, membership increased 56% in just one year, more than it did citywide. Today, the Better Bike Share Partnership is informing efforts to create equitable bike share and micro mobility solutions throughout New York City. Their efforts have become a model across the country. These solutions are more important than ever. Since Jane Jacobs helped to block expressways in New York in the 1960s, the realities of climate change have become undeniable. We have less than eight years to have carbon emissions and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius just to avoid the worst of its effects. But many of us have experienced them already from wildfires and extreme heat, to severe storms and flooding. We also know that climate change exaggerates existing systemic inequities as communities are disproportionately exposed to its impacts. Cities are the place to act. Together, the world's cities are responsible for 75% of global carbon emissions. They are also the places where the majority of us live as the world's population has tipped to urban. How we live in cities matters. For example, transportation alone is responsible for 29% of US greenhouse gas emissions with the majority of that number attributed to passenger cars. By limiting the private automobile in our public right of way, we are making room, room for people, for pedestrians, cyclists and transit riders room for green streets to manage flooding and urban forests to clean the air and lower temperatures. We can do this work by providing jobs and greater economic security to communities that have been historically under-resourced. We can make cities more equitable by connecting people to educational opportunities, services, jobs, with affordable and efficient public transportation. We can avoid the needless deaths of pedestrians and cyclists. Understanding that residents of low-income neighborhoods and communities of color are disproportionately injured and killed by traffic violence, many of whom exclusively rely on walking and public transportation. Given the urgency we face, we need to solve more than one thing at a time. The most effective work provides holistic solutions to addressing climate change while creating more equitable and livable cities in the process. Many hope that the experiments that have remade our streets as public spaces absent of cars will help to reduce carbon emissions, 
create more equitable transportation options and make streets for people. They also have the potential to do more. We have an opportunity today to learn from the shocks we encounter now to better prepare for the road ahead. Creating community resilience demands looking after those that are the most exposed to future crises. Equal access to pub public space is also critical to a healthy democracy and a just society. It gives people access to the outdoors, access to their neighbors, and a connection to one another. The freedom to walk, bike, occupy, and peacefully protest on city streets safely is a right that all must share. Only then can we ensure that our streets may serve everyone. Thank you. In, in writing from the ground up, I interviewed more than 90 people who generously share their experiences and insights. And I'm very lucky to have three of those experts with me here today to talk about their work. So I'll invite you all on. Tamika Butler is a national expert on the built environment and equity. She is founder of Tamika Butler Consulting LLC and has previously served as the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Tool Design and as Executive Director of both the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust and the Los Angeles Bike Coalition. She is currently pursuing her PhD in urban planning at the University of California, Los Angeles. Don Bella is an urbanist, designer, and artist whose work spans citywide public realm strategy and neighborhood design, parklets, and placemaking. His practice as a designer and facilitator is to elicit fundamental values and inspire a strong sense of purpose. John co-founded the Rebar and Design Studio in 2005 and was a partner and director at Gale from 2013 to 2022. John formed Bella Urbanism and Design in 2021. He currently, current work includes the SF Downtown Public Realm Action Plan with Site Lab, Urban Design Advising for Google's Neighborhood Creation Efforts in Silicon Valley, and, a consulting, and consulting with a number of municipalities on their parklet and public space programs. Danny Simmons serves as the Assistant to the Secretary and Director of Public Affairs at the USDOT. Over the past two decades, Simmons has held leadership roles in advocacy, government, and the private sector, using communications to advance sustainable transportation. She served as Director of Strategic Communications at the New York City DOT, was part of the launch team for City Bike, and then served as Head of Communications for its parent company, Motivate. Most recently, she was Global Head of Public Partnerships at Waves. Thank you all for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for that great introduction. Thank you. Sorry, I'm closing windows right now. So there we go. Um, I just wanted to start off our conversation with asking each of you some individual questions and we can, um, we can talk as a panel. So John, I'd like to start with you. Your work instigated Parking Day and inspired the official San Francisco Parklet Program, as well as similar efforts in many other cities. The pandemic has scaled this experiment. Shared spaces and open restaurants have rolled out across urban streetscapes. In looking at examples across the world, how do you think this enormous space given to parking in the public right of way can best be used? And how should we address the privatization of these spaces? Well, that's those are big questions. How, how many? How, how long do I have to respond? <laughs> One minute. Well, a few minutes. <laughs> okay, a few minutes. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say it's a real honor to be here uh, among this group and, and on this panel. And so, thank you for inviting me. And it's a, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be in this group with Danny and Tamika and you, Allison. So, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, regarding you know, the transformation of outdoor spaces during the pandemic, you know, a couple couple things. You mentioned there's 2,000 of the shared spaces in San Francisco prior during the park. Ten years of parklet program, there was eight about 80 parklets created. These are public spaces. The pandemic era shared spaces. There's about 2,000. That's equivalent to about 400,000 square feet of, of of space that's now been um, you know usable by by people. Um, and so that's a significant change, and yet it's still only a drop in the bucket in San Francisco. San Francisco has, uh, as, as you noted in your book, 440,000 on-street parking spaces. So even though we've had this radical transformation in many, many cities, it's still only a drop in the bucket in terms of the amount of available land for curbside uses. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, organizations like, like, like uh, the DOT and NACTO have well identified the value of those curbside uses. You just listed all of them. Um, opening up space, you know, reducing curbside parking means you can 
uh, enable faster transit in cities. You can um, uh, allow, uh, you know, uh, strong green stormwater infrastructure in those spaces, um, as well as um, small public spaces like parklets or the shared spaces. So I think there's a clear um, mandate for shifting, you know, how, how we utilize curbside spaces in cities. The, you know, the, the privatization is a big question. And, you know, I think my original thinking as the, you know, one of the, the starting parking day and, and helping inspire the parklet program was that by default, because these spaces, curbside spaces occupy um, precious public right of way, they should be by default be parklets, that is publicly accessible spaces. But actually over doing some research and conversations with folks in Seattle, Oakland, Vancouver and others, my, I've started to shift my perspective on that a little bit. And I think that comes back to the important role that these curbside spaces, the outdoor dining patios have had during the pandemic in terms of the service industry, right? I mean, um, you know, the service industry prior to the pandemic was one of the largest workforce sectors in the nation, about 13, five, you know, 13 and a half million jobs. And, uh, and huge, you know, 40% unemployment during the pandemic. So actually opening up curbside uses to, for commercial patios had a significant impact on employment, particularly for people in the service industry. Um, secondly, this has resulted in a powerful new advocacy group for wiser use of the curb lane. You know, a lot of these um, uses of the curb lane during the pandemic weren't driven by uh, transportation and or parks directors initially was really by economic development organizations saying, hey, we need to open up this space to support our local businesses. Um, City of San Francisco did an economic impact study of their program, and they, they learned that um, for businesses that install the uh, commercial outdoor patio, their quarterly revenues grew by 30% or $60,000, so that's a significant increase. So I actually support the role of um, the commercial outdoor dining patios if, if you know, there's th three things. First of all, they need to be, they need to adhere to design, design standards. They have to be, you know, transparent above 42 inches. They need to be accessible from the sidewalk and the street. They need to be ADA accessible. Second, they need to be geographic, there needs to be geographic equity in the program. So one of the things that San Francisco has done is provide support for businesses in areas that were hard hit during the pandemic by COVID or in priority areas uh, in, in neighborhoods with vulnerable populations. It's crucial that these tools are available throughout different neighborhoods, particularly areas that are underserved or with vulnerable populations. And the third thing is that I think it's important that we have a public seating option. So as much as I support this expansion, this change in use of the curb lane, it's crucial to me that there is there's a public seating option. And I, I wanna re refer to the um, city of Vancouver's model as an example. They have both a, 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 a public parklet program and a commercial patio program that really exploded during the pandemic. I think they have 400 commercial patios. Those commercial patios, the business owners pay for that space. They acknowledge that using the public right away for commercial use, they should, they should pay for that space. The city of Vancouver has shifted their energy away actually from public parklets, which prior uh, recently were, were actually designed and funded by the city. There was 18 parklets prior to the pandemic. They've now shifted to doing a plaza program. And they found that um, for about the same amount of time and money as a parklet, they, they create much more generous and useful pop-up plaza spaces. Um, they have a second initiative, which is a community focused parklet program. So in partnership with social service organizations and underserved neighborhoods like the downtown east side. And these parklets are designed and built by the city, but programmed and managed with a dedicated community partner to offer such programs as health clinics and safe injection sites. I think this is a good model. The idea being that we all want thriving, economically vibrant commercial districts, and we want meaningful investment in high quality and well-maintained public spaces in our neighborhoods. Right. Thank you for that. And I, you know, Tamika, I'd like to turn to you the, you know, as we think about the, the rollout of these kinds of spaces and both as parklets and using curbside areas and streets, you know, as I highlighted in my introduction during the pandemic, as streets were open to pedestrian and cyclists across the country, you know, many objected that these streets didn't serve neighborhoods equally and that they were not planned with adequate community leadership. Um, and that there's, you know, their status as safe streets overlook the realities of racial profiling and police violence. So how can we emerge from the pandemic to make the design of the streets reflective to the needs of communities? Absolutely, thanks. Thanks for such a, a great 
uh, question, uh, a nice setup, and I'll share um, my my marvel with John that I get to be part of this illustrious group. I'm happy to be here um, and be and be a part of this this great book. And and I think you know when when you wrote it, it was it was such a time, and maybe it's a time we're still in. Uh, it's, it's it's always hard to to tell uh, where where we are. And I I think what's happened is as a country over the last several years, it would be a lie to say that we haven't gotten better um, in talking about issues like racism and and equity. We definitely have, but but getting better about talking about something doesn't mean we've gotten better at it. Um, And and beyond that, I think we've seen um, as as people um, and, and communities become more polarized, Getting better at talking about one thing often means getting better at talking about um, the exact opposite of that thing. And so I think there's also more people who are comfortable ignoring factors um, like race um, and and white supremacy as they come up in our built environment. And and by large part, I think it's because all of us who do this work are good people who want to do good work. Um, And often we plan things and we plan spaces and, and we're taught to do it. Um, to the least common denominator, to the everyman, right? Um, we, we're not thinking about folks with disabilities. We're not thinking about women. We're not thinking about low-income folks of color. And so when you saw something really, you know, popping up, like the reallocation of our streets and our sidewalks, it was concerning for a lot of um, folks of color, particularly black folks. You know, if, if we were unable to avoid the videos or the pictures of George Floyd, there was a green bike lane in the background. It, it didn't save his life, right? Um, a, a street that, um, that you know, a young man might run down or a neighborhood where a young man might feel comfortable um, walking around with Skittles in his pocket, you know, those might be slow streets, um, but it doesn't protect us from dying. And I think increasingly um, as Black folks, you know, we have to understand that the way we use and take up space is threatening to people often because of the color of our skin. And so whether or not we're walking or biking or sitting, um, you know, on a sidewalk or standing on a sidewalk waiting for friends or frankly, grocery shopping, um, all of these things can expose us to risk. And so I think um, as, as we move forward and we think about how we want to build from the ground up or build back better or what, whatever folks want to do, we first have to acknowledge that the folks who have historically been doing urban planning and design work have not reflected the diversity of the country that, that we currently live in. And so we have to change that. But we also have to get beyond diversity. If we just bring in diverse you know, faces into these positions and they don't have decision-making power. Um, they don't have the resources or support to make sure that we're thinking about these things to p- press pause on a project or a policy um, until these considerations are made, then just having diversity for diversity's sake doesn't really matter. I think that's how, how we get to true inclusion, right? It has to be a sharing of power. There have to be some shifts in power. We have to let folks who have who have historically not had the power have the power and have a say into how we build from the ground up. That's absolutely going to be key. And I always tell people, you know, you have to think about any policy or practice or thing you're starting to do. Think who who stands to be the most impacted by it. That could be negatively, that could be positively, but who stands to be the most impacted? And then look around at that decision-making table. (laughs) And are those folks there? And too often in, in planning and design, the answer has been no. They haven't been there. And so we have to figure out not just how to get folks a seat at the table, but how to allow, you know, folks to determine where their own tables are, to have that self-determination and to be able to make decisions on what it looks like um, when when we're we're coming out of this, when we're creating change from the ground up. That's great. Thank you, Tamika. I wanna turn to Danny and then I'm gonna throw it open to all all of you. Um, So Danny, before working at the USDOT, you were involved in advocacy in your role at transportation alternatives, you know, starting from the the grassroots and you worked in New York City's Department of Transportation to create summer streets and launch the nation's largest bike share program. You've also worked to make carpooling accessible in your role at Waze. So what do you propose is the right mix 
of transportation options? Um, so first, um, thank you. And again, like I'm so excited to be on this panel. I feel like it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, Ali and John and Tamika have both just the work that they've done uh, has very much inspired me over the years. And it's nice to see them. And I wish that we were actually in person together because it would be um, even more fun. Um, I think to Tamika's point, um, you know, it's not up to me <laughs> to propose the right mix. Um, this is a decision that should be made uh, oftentimes at the community level. And um, as Tamika said, like, we can't just invite people to the table. We have to you know, build the capacity so that people can build their own tables um, and have those conversations. Um, I think sort of for the sake of sharing my own personal philosophy, which I think folks will probably um, agree with, but just some things that I've observed over the past year and a half in this role, you know, the secretary is very fond of saying, you shouldn't have to schlep two tons of metal with you everywhere you're going. Um, and I think that's exactly right. And I think most of us would agree with that. Um, uh, but I'll say like, I started in this field working a lot on biking and walking and what folks call kind of active transportation. And I still love biking. It's my favorite way to get around. And I love that e-bikes have really expanded the audience and the, the people who would consider um, biking as a viable way of getting around. Um, but frankly, like after launching City Bike and working on bike share programs across the country, I started to kind of wonder like, what were we doing for people that uh, live in places and have the types of trips that simply aren't possible by bike. And, um, you know, the average commute length um, in the country before the pandemic was something like 13 miles. And it's just not realistic to expect those distances to be covered uh, on bike or even e-bike. And sadly, transit hasn't kept pace in our country. And, and that's part of why I became really fascinated by carpool, which doesn't require new infrastructure but can afford, can provide a, a more affordable um, and still low carbon option for people. Um, it's a mode I think that desperately needs a facelift, um, but it's honestly probably one of the most promising underutilized tools right now for sustainable transportation um, in this country. That's just like very, um, very cost-effective both to deliver and also for the people participating in it. Um, there was a story that I read a few weeks ago that like just sticks with me in the Washington Post. Um, and it was about like one family's fall out of the middle class. And, you know, it was a story of this one family to kind of explore larger societal and economic trends that are happening in our country. But like for me, being a transportation nerd, the part that really stuck with me is that the daughter in this family is working two jobs to try to save for college. She wants to, you know, she wants to get out. She wants to better her life. Um, and her jobs aren't close to each other. She doesn't have a car. Um, and she winds up in the story texting her dad late at night from her second job at an a &W stand near the highway <laughs> to see if he can put more money into her account so that she can take an Uber or Lyft home because otherwise she's stranded and it's 11 o'clock at night. And he doesn't write her back. And he doesn't write her back because he doesn't have the money. And you just sort of see how people are stuck right now with these very awful decisions about either to not take a job because it's too expensive or complicated to get there, or they take a job and they wind up spending too much money or too much time um, or too much money on rent um, to, be able to, to be able to have that opportunity. And companies wind up having a smaller pool of employees to recruit from, which is like a huge challenge when you look around right now and you see the problems that people are having hiring from the biggest companies to like mom and pop like restaurants. And we just have to do better. Um, and so that's why, you know, I'm excited to be where I am right now at USDOT and to have like help play the small part in helping pass this once in a generation investment in American transportation, um, which hopefully will let us solve some of these things and it's not without peril um, for sure. And I know that we'll get to that hopefully more in a few minutes, but, you know, I think that we need to just expand options for people and give people more choices um, that fit with their lives and that fit with um, the conversations uh, in communities and fit with the things that Tamika are talking about, um, because otherwise I think we're really in trouble, both in terms of people's ability to trust that government can deliver for them. We're in trouble in terms of the climate and we're in trouble in terms of like people's disability to live a good life. All right. Well, maybe you can um, talk together about some things. So I, I wanted to cover traffic violence because we know, you know, the cars in cities and in places that are densely populated are, are really problematic and, and actually growing. So traffic violence 
disproportionately affects low-income people, communities of color, older adults, people with disabilities, often whom rely on walking and public transit. And during the pandemic, we've seen you know, bike share use increase in places like New York City and streets close to traffic and open streets experiments across the US, but pedestrian fat fatalities are on the rise. So other countries, including Canada and Mexico, the EU, Japan, have all seen road deaths substantially decline during the pandemic. But in the US, 46,000 people died on the roads nationally in 2021. So how do we turn this trend and emerge from the pandemic with safer streets? I mean, I, I, can, I can start us off, I, I suppose. Um, you know, I think traffic, traffic violence and, and serious death and fatalities are something that continues to plague this country. Um, it's, it's not just a, a traffic problem, right? It's a public health problem. Um, it's, it's, you know, when we think about traffic, it's, it's a climate problem. And so I think one thing we have to start doing is, is stop disregarding um, traffic violence. Um, if, if you don't care about it for the sake of, you know, caring about it, if you think only transportation people should care about it, we have to start realizing that it's totally um, intersecting with all of these other issues. Beyond that, we know, um, you know, that low-income people and folks of color are, are the most likely um, to, to suffer from, from this fate. And, and that is true for, for every disparity. So if I say it's a public health issue, we saw the same thing with COVID, right? And so at some point we have to fundamentally decide we wanna shift our culture. We wanna shift our culture. And that doesn't mean cars versus bikes or cars versus whatever it is, right? Um, it means we have to create a world in which folks have a real viable option to not be in their car. And for those who choose or have no other option or for whatever reason decide they have to be in their car, we have to start considering ways that we can change the way people move, even in cars, right? And, and I think a mistake, um, especially very early on in, in Vision Zero, what we saw in the pandemic with the way that many advocates of color and equity advocates responded uh, to slow streets and, and rebalancing streets was very similar to how we felt at the beginning of Vision Zero. It was this idea that you can't create a policy in the absence of acknowledging the history of our country. And so we can't just enforce our way out of this traffic violence, right? Because we know all the problems that are tied in with enforcement for folks of color, particularly black folks. And so when you think about our history, you can't ignore that fact. But when you think about our history, you also think about the way that racism um, and planning decisions and policies and financing have impacted infrastructure, right? And I know we're gonna continue to talk about infrastructure and, and, and funding for that, but we have to think about the communities where there has not been an investment, where in fact there has been neglect, where it has been intentional to keep people separ separated and segregated on the other side of the tracks, right? It's been intentional to raise communities, to come through with a highway. Um, and so when we are able to hold history, instead of just looking and saying, what do we do now? We have to acknowledge that we've built to this point. We didn't just get here overnight. And so a big part of doing things differently is acknowledging that we can engineer our streets differently. We can build our infrastructure differently. And we can provide incentives and funding to make other forms of transportation reliable, you know, to, to make them accessible and to ensure that people truly have a choice and don't feel like they have to be in their cars. Uh I would second that and build on it. And I think, um, you know, just to state what I hope is obvious, like we, we, this is a crisis and we have to recognize that this is not just a crisis, but it's also preventable. These deaths are preventable and we have the power to do something about it. Um, I think sometimes it just feels like, oh, like it's just like the weather, like this is just the course of doing business and it's not. Um, the, 
the secretary, when we launched the National Roadway Safety Strategy in January, talked about how it used to be sort of status quo that you would go to a restaurant and like, if you got sick, you got sick. And if you got poisoned from eating bad food, you got poisoned from eating bad food. And now we would just consider that like so crazy. Like there are food safety laws and the same exists in so many other dimensions. And I think we take for granted now that there's like seatbelts in cars, but that didn't always used to be the case either. Like we did something about it. Um, and so I think to make his point, like it's partly the road design and that's still such a huge important piece of this. It's also making sure that cars are designed more safely and that the safety features that cars have aren't just luxury add-ons that if you're rich enough, you can pay for it. And if you're not, you don't. And I mean, that addresses new cars. So that involves some sort of level of wealth to begin with, but like you have to start building it in today. Um, we should have started building it in long ago. Um, and, and so the National Railway Safety Strategy that we have kind of builds on the safe systems approach um, and adopts that for the department and looks at sort of the different aspects and the different levers we can pull to try to make uh, roads safer for everyone. Um, and it also recognizes that we can't do it alone from the federal level and that no one sector or level of government is gonna be able to do it alone because this is a huge um, a huge task. And so it's gonna take everyone working together to do this. Uh, we have more money for safety under bill um, than any time I can remember. I don't know if it's the most ever. Um, we have um, for folks on this call who are Working in local government, there's a program that is open for applications right now called um, Safe Streets and Roads for All. Um, there's a billion dollars available this year, up to six billion dollars um, potentially over the next five years um, for cities and local communities to uh, plan and implement safety uh, programs on their roadways. And I get kind of annoyed. I feel like someone is going to write about this um, that Congress wrote into the statute that 40% of this fund has to go to planning. Um, because I'm like, have a bias for action and want to see things done. But I think to Tamika's point, like there's a lot of communities where the basic planning work hasn't even been done yet um, to have the, the basis for sort of where you're going to make interventions and how you're going to do it. And so in some ways, like, I hope that folks, especially from smaller communities, because actually not to argue the point, but like the, the fatality rate is actually twice as high in rural areas as in urban areas. And so when we think about underserved communities, like that includes a lot of rural places and not just cities. Um, and I hope that folks take advantage of the funding that's available now. And we're trying to make this program like easier than ever for people to apply for and access these funds, recognizing that some of the communities that need this the most are ones that like haven't had the capacity and haven't had the staff to really try to access federal funds in the past. And those are some of the places that really need it the most and might benefit from this funding the most. That's great. John, do you want to add to that or? Um, uh, amazing comments. I guess, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about in the context of this, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragedy, it's an epidemic. Um, the second leading cause of death for people age one, one to 19 is, 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 is traffic violence. Yeah, we need to make that visible and clear. I, I, one of the things I've been thinking about is the social construction of the street, the idea that in the origin of streets, there were places for people and, and multimodal. And actually the idea of a street for cars was, 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 was con overtly constructed, intentionally constructed by the automobile industry. That's the legacy we're living with today. In, in some ways we need a national campaign focused on social reconstruction of the street as a place for people on foot and bike and transit first, and then service and private vehicles second and third. That's gonna take a major campaign and probably significant pushback against advocates for 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 um private mobility um private automobile mobility um second thought is and you write about this in the book you know establishing and enforcing uh lower speed limits in neighborhoods like the tenderloin where the majority of people are not car owners and rely on active mobility and trends to get around interested to make in your point of view on the idea of enforcement in the context of of um you know systemic racism how do how you do that in the right way um, my, my third thought is that, you know, with the advent of EV and AVs, right, maybe there's an opportunity now to introduce new industry standards for context sensitive speed limitation to disallow speeding by design. You know, you, you, Europe, the European Commission has just reached an agreement that new vehicles sold in Europe will be fitted with a speed limiter as a legal requirement by 2022. That, that to me is amazing. Like I have a speed limiter on my e-bike. I can only go 20 miles an hour. It's in a 750 watt e-bike. The average Tesla is like 
470,000 watts of power and there's no, there's no speed restrictions? Are we nuts? I mean, that's the evidence of the powerful lobby of the automobile industry that we simply have to, have to face and, 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 and push back against. Mika, do you want to respond to that before we move on? Sure. You know, I think how how do we um, enforce appropriately is something a lot of cities are trying to figure out right now. Um, there are a number of cities in California, whether it's Berkeley or LA, um, who are looking at the possibility of moving some of those enforcement, you know, um, roles to the Department of Transportation to letting other folks enforce. I think. Um, again, another example in California, re-examining the things we do enforce. Um, you know, if, if jaywalking is enforced disproportionately uh, against uh, low-income folks of color, but we know a lot of folks jaywalk, should there be jaywalking? Should, should you get a ticket for that? Should that be another way, um, you know, for police to stop and engage in interactions? Uh, with folks of color. And so I think I think there are a number of strategies to get around um, the the frankly racist policing structure we have. You know, there there's debate. Can you reform it? Do you have to abolish it? And I think, you know, part of what I'm talking about is when you get into this conversation of how can we make enforcement better, you're ignoring all these other tools we have. And I think to your point, John, right? We can do other things before we ever get to enforcement that we are choosing not to do. We have to prioritize and we have to start saying one life is too many and, and we can do things differently. And, and it's tough, right? It's a cultural change. People didn't used to wear seatbelts and then more people did. And then we changed cars to start beeping at you when you don't wear a seatbelt and to start doing all sorts of things. And so there are tools, you know, I, I would argue how many people get stopped now um, who aren't people of color for just not wearing their seatbelt, right? Because there's so many other tools we did besides just saying we're gonna enforce our way into forcing folks to wear seatbelts. Mm. Well, I want to I want to ask about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act before we turn it open to our to our Q and A and hear from our audience. But um, but you know, interestingly, the federal support for walking, biking, and transit is disrupting this you know traditional 80-20 split between highways and transit that shaped transportation since the 1980s. So, how should this additional funding for transportation best be used, and how can it benefit communities and cities? when it's given to states to distribute. Um, and I'll just tack on to that too, that if you have recommendations for also how to involve communities in the design of city streets um, using this new um, influx of funding, that would be great to hear. Um, I'll jump in first here, because I feel like I've just eat, breathe, slept this for the last year and a half. Um, for those on the call that like haven't been as in this, and I've like, I lived in New York for about over 15 years before I moved down here to DC for this crazy job. And I will still call my transportation nerd friends in New York and like talk to them about this. And they're like, nope, we don't, we're not tracking, we're not following, which like I recognize even when I worked at the local level in transportation, I was not tracking the twists and turns of federal programs all the time. Um, but so, like, just as like a little refresher for folks, the president's bipartisan infrastructure bill also called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or EJA um, is the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. It's the largest investment in public transit ever and that um, comes on the heels of like more investment in transit through a lot of the COVID relief funding. Um, it's got new programs to help states reduce um, carbon in their transportation. It's got funding to build more resilience uh, into our infrastructure and that program will come out this summer. Um, it's got um, the Safe Streets for All uh, program that I talked about um, earlier. And, you know, I think that it's a mix of programs that are uh, traditionally DOT has about 70% of their money flows by formula to the states. Um, and we don't have a ton of control over how that money is spent. And then about 30 of it under Bill or EJ um, is uh, is handed out through these discretionary grant programs. And some of those grant programs now are um, targeted directly at local governments um, with the intention of 
really helping stimulate some of the progressive work that's being done there and recognizing that at the end of the day, even though this money goes from us to the states, a lot of it passes through to local governments and in some ways like exploring whether or not having that kind of direct relationship with them and that direct funding with them um, is a more effective way to get some of these projects done. Um, so I hope that we're going to seize this moment um, and just start building things. We obviously have a tremendous repair uh, and maintenance backlog on transit and rail in particular, and obviously on our roadways um, and bridges, as you saw with the um, bridge collapse uh, in uh, Pittsburgh earlier this year. We need to modernize. Um, we need to prepare infrastructure better um, to work better for you know the AVs and EVs that John's talking about, but also just like for the threats of climate change. Um, and we also need to just expand transit and rail to start giving people more options and, and safe streets for walking and biking as well. Um, I think for in terms of engagement, what people can do is like there has been a lot of chatter, at least inside the Beltway and at least in like some of the sort of nerdier transportation outlets that wring their hands about this of what the states are going to do with that with that 70 percent of the funding and sort of how they're going to spend it and whether or not that's going to be used to widen highways um, and kind of lock in our climate and safety um, trajectory or whether or not they're going to do this um, use this to do things that i think could be better make their roads safer make their roads more resilient fix things that are out of good repair um, and and help make things um, make those facilities more multimodal with bus lanes and bike lanes and and space for people to walk that's truly safe and not just like the last few inches on the margins and i think for the folks on this call really making sure that when you're thinking about transportation advocacy you have to start to think with two sort of tracks like there is the local track still and you can't keep your can't keep to take your eyes off of that but i think you also have to think about are you having conversations with your governor in your state house? Are you having conversations with your state DOT? Do you even know who works at your state DOT? These are more opaque institutions that are a little bit farther from where folks in cities tend to live because um, capitals sometimes are divorced from where the sort of major cities are that folks have been flocking to, especially younger folks over the years. And I think it's very important to have those conversations and to make sure that um, folks at the state level know your priorities. Um, there are some pretty like obscure processes um, to, to actually like plug into and for people to learn what their MPO is and to know when to provide comments on steps and tips, like kind of seems very in the weeds, but like that's part of it. Um, and part of it is just having more conversations with state level elected um, officials about this and making it clear these are the priorities because I think they don't often hear from constituents on um, on these matters and so they kind of they kind of do what they're going to do and they kind of run their normal playbook um, and I think it's time for us to to have some conversations and, and let them know sort of how folks want that money to be spent. John, Tamika. Go ahead, John. No, this is it's a, this is beyond my my wheelhouse of expertise. So I'll I'll, I'll hand it over to Tamika. <laughs> I feel like I feel like Danny uh, has has perfectly covered it uh, as she said, uh, just based on on being front and center. Um, I do think, you know, when we think about how how this funding should be spent, um, and, and this is something that the administration is doing, and, and I just encourage, I think just figuring out what the barriers are to accessing federal funding. Um, it can be difficult, it can be hard, there could be lots of hoops. And, and sometimes, you know, whether or not we're talking about federal funding or local funding, I think what folks fail to realize is, you know, there's a lot of sexy equity work to be had in procurement and how you set up a funding structure. And so I think that's super, super uh, important for folks to think about. Too often when we think of equity or when we think of racial justice work, we like to ghettoize that work to the outreach part of a project. And we don't think about all the ways we can reduce um, some of these barriers to accessing funds. For these funds to dramatically transform people's lives and communities, they have to be able to get them, right? It can't be another situation where it's just those organizations and groups that already have power, that already have access, that already understand the complicated forms who are again making the decisions. Um, and so that's really, really important. 
uh, just can sh share a, an anecdote from a recent project in um, in St. Louis where we were working on it was a Gale project working on uh, the Ninth Street corridor which divides West I'm sorry Louisville West Louisville from downtown East Louisville divides um, the black neighborhoods from the kind of whiter neighborhood center and it tore through yeah as you noted in, the, in your introduction um, a thriving historic um, uh, uh, black district. And the effort of the city there was to try to restitch uh, these neighborhoods together through making these roadway improvements. And, and part of the requirement of working there was to actually work with local, local partners. So it was, it was scale, but also working with an excellent local firm, um, a black owned firm, a local organization that really changed the way that I think we, we um, showed up in the neighborhood and really the way that we thought about the project entirely. So it was, um, a rewarding project in a, in a very difficult kind of circumstance, trying to repair some of the legacy of, of inequitable transportation investments of the past. And, and again, re remake these streets to, to reconnect uh, neighborhoods and communities um, through the, the eyes and lens and actions of a much broader set of actors and constituents than I think were, were at it before. So it was, it was um, just a nice kind of ground level example of how that change is happening in some cities like like Louisville. Maria, I would like to um, hand it off to you to field some questions from the audience. I'm sorry we went a little longer than expected this. That's okay. That's a great I conversation. Mean, I did not want to interrupt. I did not want to jump in and take away anything that anyone was saying because it was all so important. I think it's um, very obvious that everyone's voice is needed around these conversations, that all of your perspectives are vital to the success of, of, of the um, implementation of from the ground up work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, we're just about out of time. I'm just going to pick one that I think is, is sort of a, a general summation here. Although I do want to have, I wish I could talk to you about medium-sized cities forever and cities like Scranton, Pennsylvania of 77,000 people who, you know, we're, we're finally doing our very first parking day parklet this summer. And uh, I thought it was going to be the greatest thing ever. And I've already heard things like, well, what if we put the parklet in front of our business, then people can't park there to go into our business. Like, you know, we don't want it in front of our business. So I think that there are, there's still a lot of work to be done in those kind of um, medium-sized cities um, that don't have that sort of um, broad-based support. I'm thrilled to hear about the um, Safe Streets and Roads for All project. Danny, I had no idea that existed. I think there are several people from local government on this call. Um, John, I will be reaching back out to you. Tamika, your voice is critical in this in this um, in era to give us a, a whole different perspective on things that we didn't even necessarily maybe not consider. So there's a question on this um, in the Q&A from Sarah, where are you? It was here, Sarah. I'll read it real quick. Um, I've been thinking about the institutional competency question in my work through these COVID shared spaces programs. We see different cities placing authority with different agencies. So the DOT, planning departments, public works, health departments, different agencies govern commercial patio permits, bike lanes. So she's you know, explaining all the different pe people that are kind of have a part in this. And it seems to me that does create inefficiencies it also um, exasperates the problems we've seen where in our planning processes don't include enough voices, especially those in the underserved communities and communities of color. So what should we do? Do we house all of these different programs in a single department? Do we create a new department to handle the work? Um, are most of um, at the DOT focused on or interested in people, active transportation or just cars? Do they typically engage with pub the, the community and public comment? So She's asking, what are our thoughts there? That's a big question. It's about how do we take all of these voices that are on our screen right now and all of our experiences and sort of join them together, right? In, a, in, in, a, in one concentrated effort moving forward. So I don't know, maybe Allison, you wanna take that in, you know, cause you are sort of the, the band's leader here today. You orchestrated all of us, what do you think? Well, I, I, I'm interested in everyone <laughs> joining in, but I, I can just say that I also think it's, um, it's really interesting to, or it's really important to prioritize which voices sort of create the mandate. Um, you know, when 
when folks are involved in creating something from the beginning and leading that change, they're actually creating the program for designers and people in politics and right this whole and advocacy groups. And I feel like it has to start there. I certainly found in, in looking at, um, especially work in New Orleans, where there's been so much money and funding coming in to look at how water, um, how, how water should be reframing the design of the city. Um, really it's communities that need to lead that. There, there's so much that you can gain and from allowing community or promoting communities as being the leaders in that effort and then letting design, again, letting design and governance and advocacy follow that, um, that lead. And really what it takes is investing in that process, right? Informing it with, with great science or you know, information in general and, um, and then investing in it so the people have the time to, to give to it and then the knowledge to, to lead it. So I'll invite others from, as well. Yeah, please do. Mm -hmm. it's, maybe it's a quick comment on, you know, I've mm -hmm. spent a lot of my life as a, as, a, as a tactician doing urban tactics, but actually I think mm -hmm. the greatest tactical work now is in bureaucracy and mm -hmm. the, the role of guerrilla bureaucrats actually in reshaping these institutions so that they can include more voices. So I think about, in Pittsburgh, you know, the, the, the recently formed Department of Mobility and Infrastructure that Karina Ricks was leading, that was a merger of a formerly Department of Public Works and Planning brought together those two functions. And this is happening nationwide. Oakland did a similar uh, 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 project with the formation of their OCDA, which really embraced equity as a fundamental driver in their transportation investments in an entirely new way that they couldn't have done if they remained as public works. So, I think pandemic era stuff is shifting from emergency management, you know, to these either transportation organizations. And I think that's a key, key step. And I'll just, I'll just briefly add that the pandemic should give folks hope. This was the first time in a lot of places that behind the scenes city departments had to all come together to, to attack one problem. And they did it because of a sense of urgency. And so I think it goes back to Danny's earlier point. We have to start thinking about these issues as urgent issues and figure out how we can work together. NACDO um, during the pandemic has been funding different cities to look at how they rebalance their streets. I was lucky enough to, to be a consultant on that project with Naomi Iwasaki, who now works in the equity office of LA MTA, but they put out a report that I suggest folks read that talks about what styles of community engagement they saw work. It no longer works to not engage the community at all, but it can be just as detrimental if you engage the community heavily, but behind the scenes, don't have your stuff together. If you're making folks go to multiple meetings, have different permit processes as it describes. And so I totally agree with John. Um, you know, when, when you make changes as a, as a member of a bureaucracy or as a government official, it might feel like, oh my gosh, it takes so long. But when you make those changes, they're really hard to get changed. And so they matter a lot. And we need more folks um, like Danny who are willing to go and into, into the lion's den um, and, and, and make that change. Yeah. Yep. Really well said. Danny. I mean, I just I appreciate that um, very much. Sometimes it does feel like a lion's den. Um, we are trying to make changes. It is not always fast. Um, the one thing I would say actually like putting on my advocate hat and like just food for thought for people is like, it's not just planning and transportation. It's also like housing is so important to this question. Mm -hmm. It's really, um, when you think about so much of this and so much of how people get around the, the housing plus transportation cost is what, what people look at as like an indicator. It's not, and it's often a trade-off between one or other as our cities have become more successful. People have to move further out from where they might want to find jobs or where jobs are concentrated to be able to afford um, living. And I think I've seen from my personal experience, like at a very formative age, like my first job, just like the impact of like creating good transportation and just like going back to the whole bed I thing, like fears and concerns of like displacement when projects come in. Um, and I think there is like more work to be done at that intersection of housing and transportation. And like, sadly, like I would have said that 20 years ago too. And right. I will continue to say it today. Um, it has ebbed and flowed at the federal level, but I think at the local level, it's still something that feels like very silent sometimes. Right, right. Well, you know, thank you everyone so very much. I think that um, Jane Jacobs would be very pleased to have this panel <laughs> as part of this uh, 
uh, current uh, world, I'm, I'm Tamika, thank you for the thought about being hopeful. I think that's a really great way to conclude. And Allison, back to you for coordinating this and for writing your book and for bringing these topics to light for all of us to learn from and to move forward with. Um, you know, it's just the beginning. I think of an exciting future. So just with all from the center of the living city and all of us on this call, we have um, nothing but gratitude for all the work that you have done and continue to do. And we are here championing you on. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Maria okay. and Chelsea. Right. And, and thank you to all of our panelists for joining yes. today. Really appreciate you, you taking the time. The, it's a wonderful work. We'll be following you to be sure. <laughs> thank thank you. you, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.